Dear Mr. President, ladies and gentlemen, dear students and members of the Danish Foreign Policy Society. On behalf of the Society, the Center of International Law and Justice at the Law Faculty of the University of Copenhagen and the Foreign Affairs Committee of the Danish Folketing, welcome to this seminar on the Maldives. Mr. President, show me your solar panels. <laughs> that was one of my entry remarks when we met on the Maldives in October 2010. I remember you looked slightly puzzled, but as climate minister, I was fascinated by the fact that you walked the talk and also put solar panels on your own roof. And well, after one and a half days of discussions, you realized that I was serious. Mm. And up we went on the roof of your White House, where cheerful tourists and citizens of Mala waved up at us, wondering what on earth was going up on there. Mr. President, that was the image that came to my mind when I read the news in February last year that you, in that very building, was forced to resign at gunpoint. Since then, many of us in Denmark who also remember your very active role during COP15 have followed the situation in the Maldives quite closely. And we are extremely grateful that you've made it back to wonderful Copenhagen, and it's even the Queen's birthday. What actually happened in February 2012 what are the prospects for free and fair election in December? And what should we make of the recent case of public flogging of a 15-year-old girl who was repeatedly raped by her stepfather? So, Mr. President, there's a lot on our plate, and it's a great pleasure to have you here in the Danish Parliament. The floor is yours. Thank you. Thank you. Good morning, honorable members, students, Danish Foreign Affairs League, and ladies and gentlemen, everyone present here. Um, fortunately, Minister, um, the panels are still up on our roofs, and it is saving us $2,000 a month on electricity, and of course, similar amount of carbon emission. It has been almost four years since I was last here in Denmark on the eve of the Copenhagen Climate Conference. The weather was very cold, but it was a time of optimism. Pushed by the United Nations, climate change was the preeminent international issue. And there was great hope that the world would finally agree to a legally binding agreement, treaty to reduce greenhouse gas emissions and save vulnerable countries such as ours, the Maldives. The Copenhagen Accord did not fulfill our aspirations, but it was the first time that big emitters from the developed and the developing world agreed to cut carbon emission. That was real progress, a critical step towards desperately needed common goal. I'm glad that the Maldives played some part in brokering the Copenhagen Accord. I was proud at the positive influence my tiny island, was, island nation was able to exert on the big polluters like China and the United States. It was also a period of great hope for the Maldives, not just because we had finally helped to make the world sit up and take notice of climate change, but also because the Maldives had recently made a successful transformation from 30 years of dictatorship to a transformation to democracy. We had been able to galvanize the people to political activism. We had been able to build political parties. We were able to amend the constitution and we were able to have our first free and fair presidential elections. In my view, for democracy to take root, it is so important to build the necessary infrastructure for that. Without pro proper political parties, it is impossible for democracy to take root. Freedom of association is as important as any other ingredient for a democratic society. In the Maldives, we had been able to build this democratic infrastructure, and in 2008, we held our first multi-party presidential elections. I was fortunate to become the first democratically elected president in the history of our country. 
The following years were all full of positive change. Basic freedoms, freedoms which been repressed for generations, began to take hold in the Maldives. For the first time, our people were able to speak openly without fear of arrest. Newspapers could publish what they wanted without the worry of being raided or closed down by the authorities. And for the first time in living memory, there were no political prisoners in Maldives jails. There was a palpable sense of newfound freedom. The previous dictator had been labeled predator of press freedom by reporters without borders and heavily criticized by the Amnesty International. But now the Maldives was being held by those very same NGOs as a model of liberal Islamic democracy. The contrast could not be clearer. We took an ax to the trappings of power. The former president's fleet of limousines were slashed. His multi-million dollar pleasure yacht permanently docked. And I invited the newly formed Supreme Court to take over the flamboyant presidential palace complete with its infamous gold-plated toilets. I moved the presidential residence to a small bungalow, bungalow uh, where she was up on the roof. With the money we saved, we established a social safety net for the people. We provided an old age pension, provisions for the single mothers, disabled and the orphans, and a national health insurance scheme for all. And we, were, we created a public ferry service to connect all of the, for our far-flung island communities so people could get about to work, to trade, and to visit family and friends. We also ended the policy of separating tourists from local people. Instead, we introduced a scheme which enabled local people to open guest houses. Hundreds of Maldivians opened small hotels on local islands. For the first time, foreign holidaymakers were allowed to stay in Maldivian villages and were welcome for their tourist dollars, yes, but also for their experience of living in a democracy. In many ways, our country was opening up to the world. So profound was this transformation that I even reached into the most distinctive part of our nation's identity, its language. Under the dictatorship, words were under arrest. The Maldivian language was imprisoned. There were no words in our language to describe peaceful protest or civil disobedience. There were no words to describe a detainee who may or may not be guilty of an offense. No distinction drawn between arrest and conviction. The regime labeled those arrested during human rights pro protests as covering, which means criminals. We had to lift the authoritarian laws inherited from the dictatorship, but we also had to expand the scope of critical th thought by restructuring long forgotten words associated with freedom and independence. I think George Orwell once said, if thoughts corrupt language, language can also corrupt thought. As a people, we had to free ourselves from the linguistic prison the authoritarian regime had built around us. This transformation was built on the will of the people, and it threw open the doors of artistic impression, expression, encouraging a new era of arts, culture, and music. For the first time, artists had the freedom to draw and paint whatever they wanted. Musicians could write and perform songs unhindered. And traditional Maldivian dancing was encouraged and celebrated. We held an international literary festival and invited authors from around the world to participate in our young democracy. Press freedom, political freedom, intellectual and artistic freedom, in four short years they blossomed, but then everything changed. You can remove a dictator. In a day, you can do that. But it takes years to remove the lingering remnants of a dictatorship. These are words I have often reflected upon since I was ousted in a coup d'etat last year. You can remove a dictator in a day through a revolution or, in the Maldives case, an election. But it takes a generation to take out the dictator's secret networks, intricacies, and lingering influences. 
In the Maldives, ultimately the tentacles of former regime strangled our fledgling democracy. On 7th February 2012, sections of the police and military staged a mutiny. They were controlled and encouraged by the former dictator Maumun Abdul Gayoom and his allies, alongside Islamic extremists keen to re-establish the old order. On that day, hardline elements in the police with close links to the dictatorship went on the rampage, beating up citizens, storming the national TV and radio stations and protesting in the heart of the capital. Islamic extremists broke into the National Museum and smashed the 12th century statues of Buddha, which dated from the Maldives' pre-Islamic history. This was the equivalent of the Taliban blowing up the Bamiyan Buddhas in Afghanistan or the radicals in Mali sacking the medieval archives of Timbuktu. As the coup was unfolding, I was in the military barracks. The mutineers and protesters were just outside the gates. Some rogue generals who were armed told me if I did not resign within one hour, I would be killed alongside members of my party and family. Under the watchful eye of a former military officer, a long-time Gayoom loyalist, I wrote a resignation re letter and read it on live on TV. There is an old saying in international relations, there are no such things as friends, only interests. I learned this maxim the hard way. Hours after the coup, while hundreds of our citizens were brutally beaten up by the security forces, the police even attacked some inside a hospital. Friends such as the United States, India and India duly recognized the new coup-installed regime. The decision by some countries to quickly recognize the new regime was met with horror and disbelief by hundreds of thousands of Maldivians who had personally witnessed the appalling violence and the illegal transfer of power. The coup was played out in broad daylight, in a crowded capital city, live on TV, and thanks to hundreds of small smartphones, in real time on Facebook and YouTube. A study by the Un University of Copenhagen also concluded without a doubt that the transfer of power was illegal. There are no such things as friends, only interests. The problem with this saying is that your friends are also the people who tend to best serve your interest. This has certainly been the case in the Maldives. The international community, or at least some big powers, hoped that the, by backing the coup regime, there would be stability in the Maldives and they hoped that their narrow national interest would be protected. How differently things have turned out. Since the coup, there have been huge street demonstrations, mass arrests, police beatings, and violence. Our hard-won freedoms are being reserved. Amnesty International has described the situation as a, as a human rights crisis. Freedom House says Maldives can no longer be termed as an electoral democracy, there has been unprecedented instability. The coup regime has stabbed democracy, such as India, in the back by cozying up to fellow authoritarian regimes and unilaterally cancelling a $500 million contract with an Indian corporation to upgrade the airport in the Maldives. The major powers rushed to embrace the coup regime left them without their cherished stability without democracy and without influence with those now in power in Mali. Rushing to appease the coup government was a foreign policy disaster. Today, the international community has come to see that stability, human rights and protection of their interests are impossible under the, under the current regime in Mali. The former dictatorship organized the coup because they could not see the edifice of their economic and political power crumbling. It was crumbling because Maldivians have rejected authoritarianism, rejected feudalism, and largely rejected Islamic extremism. People were enjoying their newfound freedoms. 
they couldn't be bossed around anymore or told what to do. The Islamic extremists also didn't like the Maldives' new democracy. They didn't like it because they were unpopular. The Islamists were, were never a credible electoral threat. They failed to win the presidential elections in 2008. They failed to win in local government elections. In 2011, they won less than 4% of the vote. But now, after the coup, extremists have been rewarded with three cabinet positions in the government. And in many ways, they set the tone of government communications. And they are busy trying to indoctrinate the people with a misguided version of Islam. Today, Maldives stands at the edge of a cliff. We have presidential elections due this September. I have been selected by my party, which is the country's largest party, to stand in that election. I believe we can win the presidential elections just as we did in 2008, probably more handsomely now. And when we win, we shall restart the process of democratic reform that was cut short by the last year's coup without vengeance or without vendetta. But the regime fears the will of the people. They fear our reforms that were proving so popular. They fear their own irrelevance in a peaceful, modern Muslim democracy. For these reasons, the regime has put me on trial. I am being tried in an extraordinary court by a panel of three judges handpicked by my political opponents. The United Nations Special Repertoire says that the court is biased and politicized. This view is shared by Amnesty International and UN, UN Human Rights Committee. The wider international community now understands the importance of having a free and fair election in the Maldives. And they understand that elections can't be considered free and fair if the leader of the main opposition party is banned from contesting. This is why India is now demanding I be allowed to stand in the presidential elections. And the European Union, the Commonwealth, Britain and France have all publicly said that the elections won't be considered credible if I am prevented from contesting. But the regime will try and steal this election by any means possible. They cannot be trusted to uphold democratic values they do not believe in. Instead of standing for office this September, I might be locked inside a jail cell again. The charges I face carry a three-year prison sentence. I do not fear prison. I have been jailed many times during my life. I have spent 18 months in solitary, in solitary confinement under the dictatorship in a metal cage in which I couldn't stand up or lie down. I've been tortured twice, and I am prepared to return to jail for my beliefs again and again and again. But this was never about me. September's election is not about my career prospects. It's far more important than that. It is about a principle, and that principle is democracy. It is about the fundamental right of the people of the Maldives to be ruled, not down the barrel of a gun, but peacefully with democratic consent through the ballot box. It is about whether our children, including my two, two daughters, can grow up in peace. It is about whether our mothers can reset and, re and rest easily at night. It is about the 15-year-old girl who was repeatedly raped by her stepfather, who bore her stepfather's child and had to watch her own parents murder the baby, who was then in a gross affront to justice and human decency found guilty of fornication and sentenced to be flogged by a Moldavian court. It is about all those who suffer when the principles of democracy are abandoned. To stand in, to stand in defense of these principles, even when the sun is setting on democracy, to look upon the wreckage caused by injustice and say no more, to respect human rights regardless of political expedience, these are the hallmarks of a progressive civilization. They are the principles behind the European project, and they are the qualities which the Nobel Committee recognized when they awarded last year's Peace Prize to the European Union. 
and a commitment to democratic principles is the reason why Denmark never recognized the coup regime in the Maldives. And so I appeal to you, not just as Danes, but as Democrats. Honorable MPs, please use your good office to ensure that the presidential elections in the Maldives this September are free and fair, inclusive and credible, and the regime respects the will of the people. And if you can't or won't do that for our sake, then I urge you to ensure free and fair elections for your own sake. The vast majority of the people are your friends. They share your values, they want to enjoy the democratic freedoms that you do, and they want to live in peace and harmony. They deserve to live in a democracy. But a democratic Maldives is not only your friend, it is also the best guarantor of your interests. Because a radicalized authoritarian stronghold in the Maldives is a threat. It is a threat to hundreds of thousands of Europeans who holiday there every year. It is a threat to the neighboring democracies, such as India. And it is a threat to the stability of the wider Indian Ocean, through which 40% of the world trade passes. A democratic Maldives is your friend, but it, is, but it, it also protects your interests. And so let me end with a final appeal. Please continue to support the noble cause of democracy in my country, just as you have so diligently protected your own. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Well, thank you. <laughs> and thank you very much. You said there are no friends, only interests, and you also highlighted very clearly that Maldives stands at the edge of a cliff. And that's obviously also a part of the discussion now, how do we avoid falling down that cliff? There will be, after this particular lecture, another lecture at the uh, University of Copenhagen. So this is an advertisement. So everybody interested in uh, climate change, sustainability, the president will speak at 2 o'clock at the uh, University of Copenhagen, Torvaldsen Zwei, number 40. So 2 o'clock sustainability lecture at the University of Copenhagen. So this also implies, although we will obviously also discuss climate change here, but if somebody is really, really interested in that topic, then there is an entire session also on that. So who would like to start off the uh, discussion? Yes, gentleman, Anna Sandlikson. Thank you, Mr. President, for a very vivid uh, presentation. Um, you mentioned that we all have obligations towards the future of the Maldives. Uh, can you be more specific, more concrete? You're speaking now in the House of Parliament. What can the Danish politicians, such as Lüge and her colleagues, what can they do? What can we do, basically, in practical terms, to contribute? Well, firstly, um, to very clearly articulate your words and make statements and expressions, clearly messaging so that the message is brought home in the Maldives. You are also um, a leading member of the European Union, and therefore you have so much clout. Uh, you are contributing to the Maldives very handsomely, and you've been doing that through your development agencies for quite some time. And therefore, you must be heard in Mali, uh, and I think you can have a leverage with the government in the Maldives. And I also think that with your participation, with other friends, other like-minded friends, the Indian government, uh, the British government, or anyone that you could get hold of. Um, I think uh, it, it would do us an immense amount of good um, if you keep on articulating and then do it very clearly. Do not mince words and make it clear uh, on what you want. Um, I, I, would, I would argue that you should do everything short of um, a, a military intervention. I think this is very, very serious. And as I keep stressing, this has, it's not about me. And in many ways, it's not just about the Maldives. It is about a much wider principle. It is about democracy, and it is also about stability in the Indian Ocean. We have Islamic radicalism, we have piracy, we have money laundering, we have human trafficking, we have drug dealing, we have everything going through the Indian Ocean. And if you think 
that, the, that an unstable, unstable Maldives is going to stabilize anything in the Indian Ocean. Um, I'm sorry, you are very, very wrong. Uh, um, so uh, please get your act together and, and get on with it. But one thing is, I mean, you say words, and obviously words are important, but could there also be something, I mean, in the run-up to election, election commission where the European Union as such could play a role? Or what's your dream scenario there? Um, yes, uh, thank you. Uh, 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 election observation is important. Uh, water protection is important. Um, and also, reforms are important. And with your vast experience in building democracies, uh, I'm sure there's a lot that you could do uh, um, in terms of the kind of assistance that you're giving. Uh, 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 election observation with the Maldives um, Elections Commission, working with them is, I think, very, very important. Uh, uh, and also, um, at the same time, through the UN, through the Commonwealth, through the European Union, um, in protecting the vote. And also, we feel that um, the Commission of National Inquiry that looked into the transfer of power made a number of recommendations. Uh, some of the most important recommendations were to reform the police and the military. Now you have to have mutinous elements within the military and the police. And if you are naive enough to think that they are going to let us have a free and fair election and dig their own grave, then God help us. Uh, uh, we must be able to remove these elements from the police and the military. It's not all of the police, it's not all of the military. It, these are elements within the police and the military. Uh, uh, I think those familiar with dictatorial regimes would understand uh, all sorts of guards associated with the presidential guards and the special operations police. These are uh, institutions within institutions. And you can surgically remove them. So I think uh, um, we must push to do that. Um, otherwise, uh, we, you know, we would be made to look like fools. Yes, gentleman who was also on top of the roof, <laughs> studying the solar panels. And it's still not leaking, the roof. Uh, it's still not leaking. Okay, that's good to hear. Yeah? <laughs> uh, Mr. Pre President, thank you very much for your eloquence and not least your touching tribute to freedom of expression. You know that in this country you will never say anything wrong when you express your support for that part. Um, one thing I would like to, to ask you is when we met in 2010, that was actually just before the, the Arab Spring. Uh, and what we discussed at this wonderful evening that you invited us, us out to on one of the islets was that the special thing about the Maldives is that it is actually one of the first places where you can actually see uh, Islam and democracy actually working its way, just up until the coup. And I know you have strong viewpoints about this and strong viewpoints about Wahhabism spreading in the region. Could you try to explain maybe to a wandering Western public the true facts of what is actually happening the fight between progressive and reactionaries, or if you would be put it in more lyrical terms, the fight between the darkness and the light, please. Um, thank you. Very often the Maldives is a prelude to what happens in the Middle East. It happens first in the Maldives, and then it happens in bigger Islamic societies. Uh, we were able to build political parties, galvanize our people to political activism. You must understand Husni Mubarak and President Gayoum went to university together. Um, so these are in very many senses like the 1500s European uh, kingdoms where sisters are always married to each other on all sorts of places. So you have uh, uh, rulers uh, connected to each other through all sorts of mechanisms. So once uh, one of them fall, um, it's very often that the dominoes start falling after that. Uh, we were able to galvanize our people to political activism, form political parties, 
get the constitution amended, and we did not topple the government, but we wanted to have an election. Um, now, if you look at what's now happening in Egypt, the good judge there yesterday has decided to pass sentence saying that Mr. Mubarak was scotch-free and nothing wrong with, he didn't shoot anyone, apparently he did nothing. And you think, uh, you know, that uh, uh, this is going to create stability in the new Egypt? No, it's not. Um, um, I am sure that this big country is going the same line in the same direction as the Maldives has gone. And I am certain that they are going to have a military coup as we have had. And I'm also certain that before the gunpowder actually explodes, the United States and big countries are going to recognize the new regime. And I'm sure, again, there will, we will go into this long argument of um, a free and fair election in Egypt. Uh, I, I'm not suggesting that I have the answers for this. I'm just merely making an observation that there is a blueprint in the Maldives, and you must use that to understand what's happening elsewhere in similar cultures and in similar societies. We may be small, but we represent a lot of uh, Middle Eastern or Islamic cultures. Now, on radical Islam and the uh, Wahhabism that is spreading throughout the Middle East and now East Asia. It's very, very, very worrying. Now, this is, um, this is not Islam necessarily, but more uh, Hijaz or Saudi thinking, uh, their culture. Uh, and, and it is an idea to impose that culture upon all Islamic societies. And uh, uh, I'm afraid uh, that the spread of that thinking is very, very rapid. Partly because we haven't stood up and given an alternative narrative. Other more liberal Muslims haven't come out uh, with a proper narrative that can counter uh, the radical Islamic viewpoint. Now, what the radicals are doing, they have an answer for everything, anything. You could ring up in the middle of the night and say, uh, Sheikh, I'm not able to sleep. And then the Sheikh would give you a hadith and a revelation on how the, what the Prophet did and, and what the God has prescribed on sleeping in the middle of the night. And then you go back to sleep. Uh, we, you know, we don't have a helpline. We, we don't have an alternative narrative. And, and I think uh, it's so important that uh, uh, we come up with an alternative narrative. Uh, a, a, a liberal version of Islam, or actual version of Islam. Uh, I, I wouldn't argue that it's a, it's a liberal version of Islam. Um, radical Islam is spreading like wildfire even in Sri Lanka. Uh, um, and, and this is happening all over the world, all over the Asian, uh, East Asia, uh, in Thailand, Philippines, Malaysia, Indonesia, Singapore, um, even India and Sri Lanka. Uh, and because Maldives is um, uh, a very Islamic country, apparently, it's, it, is able to, uh, uh, it is able to play a very, very important role in the spread of these re religious ideas. And similarly, I believe that um, with proper democracy in the Maldives, we can play a, a very important role as a counter to the Reformation, or rather the Jesuits have to come up quickly. It would be nice to have a helpline though, I mean many <laughs> sort of ways of life. Who would like to ask the next question? Yes, gentleman here. Hello Mr. President, thank you for speaking. Please stand up, yeah. Yeah. so we we'll see you. Um, I would like to ask you if you have any thoughts on whether your uh, activism as a president, like and you are an activist president where most presidents of political presidents not being so engaged in annoying or, or, or difficult matters or, such as climate change and uh, fair trading. Um, do you think that your level of activism has damaged your ability to function as a president? It 
was never an idea to be president at any cost. It was always the intention that my views and our beliefs are intact. It was never the idea that I compromise on everything and try to, you know, power was never the goal and it never is. Uh, I would keep on saying what I think is true, you like it or not. Uh, uh, and I believe that the vast majority of the people of any country wants their leaders to be more frank, to be more clear, and to articulate so that the people also actually understand what's going on. Uh, very often we are left in the dark and not knowing um, uh, how, why uh, um, issues take one form or another. Um, and therefore, um, very often, it is, it is when, you know, after you drop the ball, that you suddenly realize, oh my God, that's what happened, so let's have an inquiry. Uh, uh, the, 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 the point is that you don't drop the ball, that you don't go, go to pick up the pieces after you, you've ruined it. Uh, my, my point is that uh, uh, heads of states, or whoever you are, even the, you know, whatever you may be, you must tell the truth, and, and you must say it from your heart. And sometimes people don't like me, um, <laughs> and sometimes they try to kill me or mob me. Um, but we must go on, we must go on. Yes, Klaus Karl Petersen, Director of Foreign Policy Society. Um, you appealed for support from us and from other like-minded countries. Uh, I believe that some countries uh, are more like-minded with uh, the present government, the present illegal government. Uh, is that a big problem? Is uh, financial support uh, flowing in from the paragon of democracy called Saudi Arabia, for instance, uh, where uh, Salafists get a lot of money from and so on. Is that a problem? Um, uh, and, and, and Well, when we are on this subject of support, um, what about a friendly naval visit <laughs> uh, in September from, you know, we have some pretty nice big modern warships that are operating in the Gulf and so on. They could maybe duck and show the flag. And They're always there now. The, the big ships, um, US, uh, uh, um, some of the U.S. bigger um, aircraft carriers were recently there. Um, <laughs> uh, uh, minutes, I think. Um, uh, it, it was there just recently. Um, and the Indian um, warships are very often also there. Yes, any pressure. Uh, and, and to impress upon the regime in the Maldives that you cannot go scotch-free and do this. Uh, and, and hopefully to get the message very clearly home, uh, this is not on. Um, uh, yes, I, I, I believe um, that there are other countries who wouldn't want um, necessarily you know, a government or an idea uh, such as ours to flourish. I'm sure there are people who, who, who detest us. Uh, but um, I think the vast majority of the people of this planet understands what we are talking about. Uh, and in my view, uh, it's always far more important uh, uh, to get um, the people uh, understanding the need for reforms and the need for democracy. In direct answer to your question, yes. Uh, um, there are uh, uh, countries, institutions, and people uh, who are assisting the regime in Mali. And, and for these people, they have a vested interest in maintaining that. Um, one of the American commentators um, has suggested that the Maldives was the first climate change coup. Um, unfortunately, I'm, I'm never a, a strong believer of uh, conspiracy theories. Uh, uh, but uh, um, unfortunately or ironically, uh, the countries 
who did not want to sign the Copenhagen Accord were the countries who instantly recognized the government in the Maldives. Good day, Mr. President. My name is Søren Nielsen. I'm a veterinary surgeon, and actually I'm authorized as such by the Ministry of Fisheries and Agriculture of the Maldives. And I have, at some <laughs> occasions, also had the opportunity to practice there. Yeah. And, and the you had to look at my cat also. <laughs> I have uh, two sons and a daughter-in-law working as expats in uh, the Maldives. Uh, one of them is, was, he's now back again, he was a diving instructor and the other two are pilots with the Moldavian air taxi. And you have probably been piloting, been piloted by some of them. And uh, my question to you is because I, because of my interest in the Maldives, I come there occasionally to myself, is that I read on a daily basis, I read the Moldavian newspapers and I'm a little bit worried about this coming election because apparently the, your opposition uh, refrains or they don't want uh, inspectors from other countries to come and inspect if these elections are being fair and so on. Uh, and I wonder if you have any ideas of that, if that will be a problem when the election is coming. Uh, the other point is that I yesterday read in a leading Danish newspaper that the Maldives are listed as uh, with uh, Saudi Arabia and a few other countries as the second most uh, aggressive against, Christi uh, against Christianity and they are pursuing Christians more than any other countries. And I wonder if you come into power again, if you are able to do something about that, to have more freedom of faith, of religion. So two very uh, important questions, but what happened to the cat, Mr. President? Um, thank you very much, <laughs> sir. Um, uh, the gentleman there um, looked after my cat soon after the coup. Um, but uh, my daughter's cat, actually. And, and thank you very much. But my daughters feel that they, uh, they beat up the cat and pepper sprayed it and murdered it. Uh, uh, and, and so there it is. It, so in answer to your question, uh, please sit. Uh, in, in answer to your question, yes, there is a difficulty in uh, uh, accepting or getting the regime to accept international observers. But I never give up hope. And I don't necessarily go on a, 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 a pessimistic line of thinking. I believe that this can be done. And I, I, and I think everyone should, uh, should believe that this can be done and this must be done. And we must keep saying that this must be done. And I think, yes, we, all what we can do is give our best shot at it. And, and, and we must work on that regard. Yes, there has been a lot of xenophobia, Islamic, uh, you know, rhetoric uh, and, uh, and a lot of, lot of uh, uh, intolerance going on in the Maldives. I, I mentioned uh, uh, smashing of the 12th century statue of the Buddha. Uh, these were from our pre-Islamic history. And also, uh, um, we've lost a number of pre-Islamic manuscripts as well. Uh, so uh, there is this idea of wanting to return back to Hijaz as it was in the seventh century. This is Wahhabism in, in, in you know, I think that that's Wahhabism in principle. There is that idea that they want to revert us back to the, where, how it was exactly in the seventh century Hijaz. And it is, it is difficult and it is worrying, but um, I hope that our society would our society, I believe, they are the vast majority of them are very, very tolerant people, and I think if the, all this rhetoric is removed from the you know official discourse, then there will be more a, a much more liberal society, and I assure you, the rhetoric will be removed from the official discourse. Yes, all the way to the back. Please wait for the microphone. 
and condolences about the cat. And, okay. Do you want to continue? Oh, yeah, please go ahead. Um, thank you for being here, Mr. President. I would like to hear a little bit about your thoughts about climate change. You mentioned the Copenhagen Accord yourself. Um, it seems that some of the momentum in especially the Western countries to do something about climate change disappeared with the financial crisis. Um, what do you think about, like, what is your view of the future of island states like the Maldives today, and what can the Western countries do about it? Um, thank you. I was going to say that it is Her Majesty's birthday, and, and you were the first woman. Uh, I just suddenly remembered that it is Her Majesty's birthday today, and happy birthday, um, the, the Queen. Um, we have a full session on climate change in, Copen uh, in, in the university. Uh, but as you said, uh, yes, uh, um, uh, we've, you know, um, the attention that was given to climate change issues leading up to the Copenhagen summit, it's dwindled a lot. And you have had doubters and others uh, coming out and campaigning um, against um, uh, the issues and against people like me. And there's been a lot of um, an empty um, um, climate change talk going on. And uh, uh, the future, your question is, um, so how do I see my future? It's not mine alone, it's yours as well. Our future is very bleak. Uh, and, and, you know, sitting here with bigger, on bigger land masses, you may think that you are safer. But what we're talking is not only about sea level rise. We are talking about climate aberration. Uh, the winters would be colder, the summers would be hotter, the winds would be stronger, the swells bigger. Everything is going to change. And, and we are at a tipping point. And, and you said that uh, uh, the financial crisis. I mean, I, I always think that the financial crisis is the most opportune thing for people to change their ways. With new green jobs, I mean, fossil fuel is obsolete technology. It's dirty, it's untidy, it's loud, it's cumbersome, and it's obsolete, and it's expensive. You have all these other renewables. Uh, uh, that is, you know, uh, that is the future. And if countries can't um, um, embrace the future, then you can't be the leaders of tomorrow. Uh, uh, I find it quite ironic that countries emerging as superpowers or with newfound wealth, unable to embrace the new technology, it's extremely silly of them. And, and I think uh, these countries would probably be left behind um, and then your new leaders um, would be those who are able to go towards the new technology, those who are able to understand the delicate nature of the environment of the world. You know, you just, there is no plan B because there is no planet B. We just have this one. Uh, and then, you know, you can't cut a deal with physics. You can't cut a deal with mother nature. It's, it's, it's a science and it's a precise science. It's there uh, and we just, we just have to live with it. Uh, and I hope that people understand this. And I believe that politicians would only do as much as you tell them to do. She would do as, uh, as much as you tell her to do as the people tell her to do. Well, I would do as much as you know, my people tell me to do. Uh, 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 but one gentleman here said that I've been saying other things other than what the people tell me to say. Uh, but my point is that for us to save the Maldives, and for both of us to be saved and our children to have a bright future, uh, we must act. We must be out on the streets. Uh, tweeting wouldn't just necessarily uh, uh, get over this, you know. We must do something more active. We have this idea that because you're, you know, you, you're, you're writing about 10, 15 tweets a day, of course you're doing a lot. <laughs> but you actually need to do something. More than tweets, yeah. 
Okay, I think we have time for a final question. Would anybody like to ask that? Yes, gentlemen. Yep. Yes, hello, Mr. President. Um, I imagine while you were being president, you had, I, I'm not familiar with the constitution of the Mal Maldives, but I imagine you had some role in leading the military. And um, the experience shows that the, the, the very generals, uh, your own very generals, were uh, turned against you. So uh, in the case you return to power in the Maldives, do you think uh, those generals will just uh, peacefully accept your uh, command in chief and leave away? And if not, what do you then think could be done? Thank you. Uh, uh, thank you. This is very, very you know, I, I believe that there is something called inertia. Uh, that, that surrounds events with a popular vote. If the people of our country wants me as a clear leader and a clear commander-in-chief, it's up to them. Uh, and I, I am seeing that they are going to give me a big vote. Uh, they will probably give me 70%, and it's huge. Uh, uh, and I think uh, when that happens, uh, uh, all these generals and, you know, all these kind of irrelevant people would have to understand and there would be inertia around issues. And I hope that that would give me space or give us the space to reform the place. Again, I, I want to stress there should not be an idea of revenge or vendetta. I, I, I must, I, we must not entertain this idea that we want to get at them. Yes, of course they are evil and bad and you know, all the adjectives that I'm not going to say now. But, but we, will, we, must, we must not, uh, uh, we must not be, let's say, so, so little. Uh, we must be able to work with them. Uh, and, and we must be able to reform them. There are elements within the military whom we should, of course, uh, address, uh, but that doesn't necessarily mean we are going to disband the Maldive military or the police. Uh, um, you know, Iraq has never got around doing anything after after disbanding uh, uh, Saddam's military. We thought that everyone was against, or everyone in the military uh, would be against democracy, which is not true. There are elements within any institution who would be against many, many things. So uh, um, we can't have a blanket uh, uh, um, solution for this, and I think uh, we must make good use of our minds and, and always be as compassionate as possible. And, and, but this is, this is the only reason why people are not voting for me. Uh, 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 they keep saying now, President, if you want to be that compassionate again, you know, we will go through the same damn thing. Um, so I have, I have also learned, um, and this has been a very big learning curve. Thank you. I think that's a brilliant way to end with the steep learning curve. Thank you very much for coming and making the clear sort of statement about democracy, about uh, freedom, but obviously also about climate change. We um, thought a bit about what to give you as a present so you can remember this uh, event. And when I went to the Maldives, I got this brilliant Maldivian football jersey. So that would obviously have been one thing would give you a, a Danish football jersey. But we decided something else, because Cup 15 was called Hopenhagen. Well, one could debate what, whether it was Hopenhagen at the end, but this is a optimist. <laughs> and uh, this will hopefully sort of also give you some joy, but also hope for the upcoming election. And we will all follow it very intensely. Thank you very much, Mr. President. Well, <laughs> thank you. Thank you very much. And uh, I would also especially like to thank my friends, the ministers who visited the Maldives, who've seen it firsthand. And I'm now with the view that you've actually understood what's going on. They're clever. and. So with clever people like you, I'm sure we are going to have a bright future. Thank you. Thank you very much.